Hey guys, welcome back to our channel and my BMW F30 rescue project. I bought my 2013 BMW 320i with the N7 4 cylinder turbocharged motor a few months ago with a seized engine. The previous owner didn't know what happened to it. He said he was driving, the engine just simply stopped working. Now these engines are notorious for timing chain failures, but they're otherwise a fairly robust motor. I bought it thinking that the timing chain has failed and I'm gonna do a quick head refurbishment. However, after pulling the motor in the last episode, we figured out that there's nothing wrong with the timing chain and the top end. In fact, the motor has likely spun a rod. So what I did is I pulled the spare motor from the junkyard with an absolutely unknown history and unknown mileage for the matter, but spinning freely. In other words, you can rotate the crank, engine spins freely, doesn't make any weird noises, everything seems to be all right. I took that apart as well. The engine is filthy, okay? It, it, it looks like the previous owner has never changed the oil in this motor. How anybody drives these cars like that is beyond me, but that's neither here nor there. I was not originally planning on taking the engine apart. I was just simply going to swap over accessories from uh, my original motor to this one. However, the condition of the original motor is way better aside from the spun bearing. So what I did is I split the two motors apart and I'm gonna try to create one engine with a good, hopefully bottom end and a clean head with new timing chains and everything else that I've got. I've got boxes of parts behind me. So in this episode, we're gonna try and put this engine back together, put it in the car, put the car on the road, and hopefully go for a drive. All right, let's see if we can make it work. All right, heads on. We've got a couple of different bolts here. We've got some bigger ones, some smaller ones, and then we've got the torques that go on the front. The smaller ones are on the outside of the motor, the big ones are in the middle. They all have washers and they all have to be lubed up and torqued to spec. The next thing to do is timing. Now, all of the manuals and most of the videos that you see about doing timing on this assume that the head hasn't really moved. So, you know, you've got your brackets on top, everything's in place, everything's good. That's not the case here because to remove the head bolts, I had to take the brackets off so I can move the cams and the valve adjustment here. So basically I'm starting from scratch. The cams have to be aligned properly and the tools have to all be put in place. On top of that, BMW in their infinite wisdom do not lock the crankshaft to the block, but rather lock the crankshaft through this little pin here to the flywheel, which I don't have. So what I gotta do now is I actually gotta take the engine off the stand, put the flywheel on, lock the crank at top that center so that I can actually do the timing, which is silly, but it is what it is. It's not a very complicated thing to do, but it is gonna take some time because I'm gonna have to move the engine in and out and I gotta clean this mess that's sitting in the garage. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna lock the cams, put the flywheel, put the oil pump, and then do the timing.
this is the pump from the original motor, which when I took it off, I did not have the locking tool. So I have not locked this balance shaft where it's supposed to be. We have to take out the strainer and then lock the shaft here. Crankshaft's locked, camshafts are locked. The balance shaft is locked. So we are ready for the timing job. First things first, let's swap the front crank seal before we go ahead and start putting in the timing components. First comes the oil pump pulley. It's a whole assembly, which is going to slide over in place. This with three bolts holding it. All right, those are the phasers on. So now we gotta put the snout on. So keep in mind, we've got the timing sprocket and we also have the oil pump sprocket driving the back. So they all have to line up here. Try not to tear apart the new seal that we installed. So that catches both sprockets in. Before we lock all this up, we just gotta torque all the rails. We've got 10 Nm at the top and 24 for the two at the bottom. Okay, with that done, we can go ahead and lock the phasers using this tool. Before we get to the last part here, we need to torque down the sprocket, 70 foot pounds or 95 Newton meters. Of course, to do that, you need to have the holding tool in place. Here we go. With that out of the way, we can take the pin out of the tensioner and put tension on the oil chain. There it is. So now we have tension on the timing chain and we also have tension on the oil chain. All right, the next part is just a little bit sketchy. So if you believe in doing things through the manual and all the right way, maybe skip a couple of minutes forward. Here's the problem. To tighten this bolt up, I need to lock the crank, all right? Easy enough, right? The problem is this is designed to be locked with the transmission in place, the tool that locks the teeth of the flywheel or the torque plate right there actually locks in the bottom of the transmission right there. So this piece slides in there and basically locks the crankshaft to the transmission. Now, as you may have guessed, I don't have a transmission and the engine is on a stand. This is where looking at these things in the way BMW is designed is a little bit annoying because 
plenty of people do timing chains on engine stands, okay? It's a little bit weird to require a transmission so you can lock your crank. So we've got a problem. I cannot lock my crank using this tool to torque the bolt. Now there's a couple of ways I can go around it. I guess I can leave that bolt and torque it in place once I mount the transmission. But the problem is I cannot close anything else up because all of the locking tools have to stay in place before I can torque that bolt. So not really the best option. The second thing is to try and figure out a way to lock the crank so it doesn't move so that I can torque it. The torque's not little, it's 100 Newton meters, I think on the front with another 270 degrees. So it's quite a lot of torque on that bolt. So while we do have this pin in place here, which puts the correct position of the crankshaft, you cannot torque against this pin. You're gonna either bend the pin or you're gonna damage the housing there. But don't do it. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do some trickery here and basically use my engine stand and the flex plate which I already said I don't care about. And I'm gonna try and lock the crank in place using a couple of different manual methods. Now, keep in mind also that the crank is currently locked to the chains, which are locked to the camshaft. So technically we have some backup there. So I'm gonna get a second pair of hands here and try and hold the crank in place while I torque the bolt in the front. The sprocket is technically locked to the crank as well. So we're gonna have a couple of things holding this crank in place. And hopefully we don't do any damage going after the torque of this bolt. Honestly, this is not the smartest thing I've ever seen from a car manufacturer because not be able to time the engine on a stand is a little bit limiting. Let's put it that way. Okay, this is the fun part. We gotta do 270 degrees. So we're gonna go from zero all the way around to here. So I've marked the bolt to the snout and we have to do 270 degrees on the bolt while holding the crank. So let's see if we're gonna be able to do that without breaking the engine. All right, off camera here, I did a little bit of extra work, transmissions on, pretty much all the accessories are back on the engine, wiring, harness, ECU, all that sort of stuff. Also the engine bay, cleaned up a little bit, new engine mounts, new transmission mounts, more or less ready to go. Now I'm gonna speed this up a little bit. I'm sure you guys don't need to watch me struggle to put this engine in here. It was pain in the butt last time when I was taking it out. So let's up the speed a little bit and hopefully you get to start the engine today.
All right, car's done. Now, this is the first BMW I've ever actually driven. How I've managed to avoid BMWs in the 25 years that I've been working on European cars is not important. I spent the last 20 years rebuilding Volkswagens, Audis, Mercedes, that kind of stuff. Never once wanted a BMW. That's not to say I don't like some of the BMW models. I definitely do. There's plenty of BMWs that I absolutely love. I love the looks of. Never wanted to own one. Now, a lot of people will tell you that anything past, you know, the mid 2000s is absolute garbage. And you can read the stories all over the place about seized engines. This car is a clear example of what happens when you spin a bearing. Perfectly fine car with somewhat fine mileage at 180,000 kilometers is basically ready for the garbage because it's on the bearing. Something I've never seen on any one of my Audis or Volkswagen's Mercedes or anything like that. So I'm not sure what BMW is doing with the engines, but that's neither here nor there. I actually love the F30 chassis um, from the outside as far as looks are concerned okay this is a sharp looking car in the wagon format it is absolutely gorgeous now that i'm actually driving it not impressed by any stretch of imagination now granted this is a 320 so it's the lowest of the low in north america but everything in this chassis feels cheap all the plastic feels cheap everything's cracked and broken clearly the previous owner wasn't taking care of it taking the engine out was a massive pain in the ass it looks like a lot of engineering was sort of left on the table when they were building these cars. The N20 motor in this car feels quite dull. I've owned quite a few 2.0-liter turbos in all of my Audis, the A4s, the Q5s, and it always kind of feels underpowered for these cars. Certainly, if you're looking for more excitement, this is not it. Um, again, granted, this is a 320, but even in my 528, the same motor is just, eh, it's okay. The saving grace for this car is the manual transmission, which on a nice twisty road makes it a little bit more entertaining to drive, but it doesn't make up for the rest of the vehicle's shortcomings, to be honest with you. Pretty sure this car is gonna go for sale pretty quick. I don't really have any personal attachment to it. Now, unfortunately, after pulling the engine out, doing the head gasket timing job and everything else, as you saw in the episode, I did end up reusing the oil pump from the original block in this car. The oil pump is now whining quite significantly of course i didn't drive the car before i bought it because the engine was already seized so it was a bit of a gamble using the original oil pump clearly the oil pump needs to be replaced rebuilt or whatever and unfortunately to do that i have to take the oil pan back off and possibly do the timing chain again depending on whether i replace the entire module or just the oil pump at the back this puts a damper on this whole process because so far i was doing pretty good with this for the amount of money that I bought the car for and the amount of money I spent on parts. And now, unfortunately, I've added probably another couple of days worth of work to replace the oil pump. It seems to be running fine, but that noise is quite concerning. So it will have to be replaced. Which takes us to the end of this episode. Guys, absolutely love the F30 chassis. Absolutely hate the N20 engine. It's got no performance whatsoever. The interior of this car is cheap to say the least. So there's a very good chance I'm gonna sell this car fairly quickly. And if I don't, in the next episode, we're going to have to do the oil pump on the bottom because that wine that it's got is absolutely driving me nuts. But for now, thank you so much for watching. If you like what you see, click the thumbs up. If you want to see more, click subscribe. And I'll see you guys next time.